Welcome to Trinity for our Good Friday service, the last of our services for this Lent. Huh? Let's see, what comes after Lent? Easter. Something about Easter, maybe, huh? Yeah, and I wanted to just remind everyone that there is a sunrise service uh, at St. Paul's in Loman, and it begins at 6.30, that's a.m., And there's breakfast afterward. Hmm? Are there any other announcements that we need to share? Then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship through some music. All you who pass this way, Look and see the shadow of sin. all you who pass this way, Look and see the of the all you who pass this way, Look and see the of our all you who pass this way, Look and see the of Jesus Christ. behold the Lamb of God. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. 
When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. This is not what Jesus wanted. Of course, he didn't want to take this path. In fact, he prayed about it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, let it be so. Only not my will, let your will be done. He didn't want the humiliation. He didn't want the beatings. Certainly, he didn't want the death that was about to be his. But even more than that, he didn't want the people, God's people, to realize what they were doing. They were killing the rightful king. And they didn't want them to miss what God was doing by this event, too. He said it, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. They're going to kill the, the, the one that you sent, not to judge them, not to bring vengeance upon them, but to save them. And they will miss that. They will not understand. That is what God is doing in this event. Taking what they thought would be an execution of a criminal and turning it around to be a, the means of God's saving of the world. You know, many of these people later would become his disciples. Disciples of the way. But now, they are rejecting him. And Jesus laments that. That saddens him. So what does he do? He forgives them. He asks God to forgive them. And he persists at it too. His lament turns into a purpose, his purpose, to continue to reach out to the world that at some time ha has rejected him. And that's what we do as his church. We persist in giving the message so that God's people might be saved. How long do we keep at it? Well, until everybody claims him as, as their king, their Lord, or Jesus comes again, whichever comes first, <clears throat> I guess. So 
For me, I am saddened when people don't see, they don't understand what's going on with Christ. Oh, I want to be, you know, kind of nasty to him, actually, but, but in my heart of hearts, I know that God is lamenting their loss, if that's to be. Let us pray. Forgiving Christ, you bore the weight of being wrongly condemned. We often do not know the consequences of our actions for others or for ourselves. Come alongside us in the darkness and open our eyes to see and admit to our sins. Then give us the grace to be forgiven and forgiving and the courage to right the wrongs. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have this and we have, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you get a sense of righteous pleasure when people get what they deserve? Huh? <clears throat> they get what's coming to them? They're just desserts? Jesus laments and does everything he can to bring them back to God's love. Jesus actually desires that all should be saved. The scriptures are clear about that. God doesn't want anyone to perish. Think of that. Even the people that are crucifying him. He wants to save them for God's kingdom, too. You know, Sparky Anderson, he was the manager of the Detroit Tigers some years ago, and he tried to draw a distinction between grace and mercy. He said, grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's good stuff. <laughs> and mercy is not getting what we do. That's the, that's the bad stuff. I don't know. I kind of think they're both the same, but, but Jesus did not give us the judgment that we deserve. In a sense, he was like one of those two thieves that was hanging on the cross next to him. Yeah. Remember I said thief, right? Well, Jesus was kind of a thief. Yeah. Only he didn't steal people's goods or their possessions. He stole their sin. <clears throat> he was a sin stealer. He took our sins and their consequence, which is eternal death, upon himself. And he gave us instead a place in God's kingdom. 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom, the sinner said. And to this sinner to, who deserves death, a dying king said, Today, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Reconciling Christ, we are weighed down by guilt that separates us from God. You reached out to the thief that was weighed down with his guilt, took that guilt upon yourself, and lifted that weight from him. Even when we forget you, for love's sake, remember us and bring us back into the grace that makes whole everything that is broken. <clears throat> This is going to be sung as a round. Uh, Becky will start, and when she gets through the top line, the first line, then uh, I'll join her, uh, and, we, and we'll just go from top to bottom. And um, this side is with me, and this side is sings with Becky. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus laments <clears throat> broken relationships. And among the most important of relationships is the family. And so Jesus creates one with, with his disciples. Looking at his mother, he said, Woman, behold your son. And he was indicating John, the disciple John, who was called the beloved disciple. And then looking at John, he said, Behold your mother. And he connected them two together through a, a prayer that he taught his disciples. <clears throat> Sometimes it's called the family prayer. And it begins, Our Father. We are all part of one family with God as our Father. Yeah. And we are called to care for each other. Just as we would care for a brother or a sister in a biological family. That's the character, the quality that Jesus was bringing into his family, his church. When he gave that word, behold your son, behold your mother. Loving Jesus, we carry the weight of the people we love, 
showing concern for their sorrows and suffering. Our care for them is deep, and sometimes there is not much we can do. Come alongside us in the darkness and cradle the ones we love in your strong hands. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this was God's son. Rejected by his people. <clears throat> And now abandoned by his father in heaven? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cries these words, surely out of weakness at, at, at what the crucifixion was doing to him. But that was real. He may have been the son of God, but his sense of separation from God was as real as anyone else's separation could be. Jesus knows those words all too well. Those words are from a song. Well, we call them psalms, but it was from Psalm 22. And the interesting thing about this psalm is that while there is several places where Jesus laments his abandonment by God, the psalm is also filled with hope as well. For instance, after these cries of abandonment, Jesus, the psalm says, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. Then the lament returns. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Jesus is living out the words of this ancient psalm. As they divided his clothes, pierced his hands and feet. But then once again, there is this trust. And still, Lord, you are not far from me. You are my strength. And it ends this way. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Lord Jesus Christ, you know what it is to feel that God is far away. You know what it is to call out for God's presence. Come alongside us when we are weighed down with the de despair of feeling abandoned by God and empower us to call out to God for salvation.
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. On the cross, Jesus is living out what it means to be thirsty, not just in a physical sense, but thirsty for God's reign, thirsty for God to turn things around and restore the beautiful creation that he created. The one who said he would provide living water, the one who turned water of ritual purification into the wine of the new covenant, this Jesus said, let all who are thirsty come to me and drink. Is now, he is now drinking the bitter draught of death, the vinegar of injustice. He laments all the suffering of this world and cries out against it. I thirst. <clears throat> For the sake of my people, in, in connection with my people, within connection with God's people, I thirst for them, for God's righteousness. Remember the Beatitudes? One of them was, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They will be filled with the righteousness of Christ because of the forgiveness he won for them, for one thing. But he also fills us with a desire to make right the things that are wrong. When we quench the <clears throat> thirst of, of neighbors, even of our enemies, all over the world, not only the physical thirst, but good relationships, healthy relationships, give people dignity. That's quenching their thirst spiritually too. Suffering Savior, in all our thirst, in all our sickness, in all our longing, in all our pain, you are there. Come alongside us in the darkness and walk with us through all our suffering. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I'm working on my trolley at my house. It's along the wall about a foot from the ceiling. I've been working on it for what seemed like forever, but it's not finished yet. In the meantime, there are two ladders, one in our kitchen and one in our dining room. And my wife comes in and says, uh, are you gonna put those ladders away? And I say, 
but I'm not finished yet. Well, when will you be finished? I don't know. Probably sometime after Easter. Well, I started to clean up a little bit anyway. Put the ladders away. And all the tools and supplies that covered all the counters in our house, I put most of those away too. But I'll bring them out again because the job's not finished. I, had, I saw a tape that I was preparing for the service on a videotape, and it was uh, showed various scenes from the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. There was, there was Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden, for instance, and there was Noah and the ark, and there was Moses crashing down with the Ten Commandments on the tablets, and there was Jesus' birth. Yeah various scenes in Jesus' ministry. And all throughout the video, the sign that was flashing, it was just one word, unfinished. It was saying that God has been working all throughout history to restore his creation, to work the work of salvation. But it was unfinished. And towards the end of the video, there was one scene and, and, and in that scene, the, the word unfinished, well, the, the U and the N began to break up into little pieces that just got poof. And it ended up with the word finished. And that scene was Jesus Christ on the cross. Everything that needed to be accomplished for our salvation, for our restoration to God, was accomplished on that cross. There are still some details to be worked out. Well, not really details to be worked out, but rather a job that proclaims that finishedness to the whole world. And that's our job. And then when Jesus comes again, that work in a glorious sense, will be finished. Dearest Jesus, when we mourn, when we are afraid, when we come to our own endings, you are there. Come alongside us in the darkness and carry us through death to life. May all our endings end in you. <laughs> It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. 
but all, their, all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. I commend my life. Trusting in you, Lord, Father. Trusting that you will take my life. And as you have already done, used it for a good purpose and then brought me into your presence for eternal life. He trusted God so Completely. Here's the image that I have. Going to the circus, there's the trapeze artist. And he's swinging up and up high. In one scene, anyway, there's two people. One of them is on a bar of trapeze that has his legs curled over it and kind of hanging down beneath it. And the other one is on a trapeze holding, his, holding the bar and swinging out towards the other one. The one who's holding the bar with his hands is called the flyer. He flies through the air and he looks so impressive. And the one who has his hands free is called the catcher and his job is to catch the flyer. Now when uh, uh, they're doing this, they're given some instructions, of course, but one of them, and one of the most important ones, is this. When the flyer lets go of the bar and flies towards the catcher, and he reaches out his hands, He's not to grab a hold of the catcher's arms. He's to let the catcher catch him. Now that is intuitively the wrong thing to do in my judgment. You want to just instinctively grab onto that, per that catcher's wrist. If you do, both of you are likely to have broken wrists and come crashing down. You simply allow the catcher to catch you. Now think about that for a minute. Is that trust? It's the kind of trust that Jesus exercised during his life and the kind of trust that he exercised at his death, too. And I think such trust is really, uh, stands at the very foundation of our relief from all laments. Father, in the end, despite all the weight of the laments he suffered, laments of injustice, justice, sorrow, despair, suffering, and endings. Jesus proved to be the cornerstone of trust. May we begin, continue, end our lives in such trust. All that we have prayed for, we do so in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. As uh, Becky sings that final song, this is soul, I invite all of us to come up and take one. You don't have to find the one that you put in there. We take one of the candles and turn it off, and I'll set up the baskets again. And as you circle around, and as she is singing, simply exit the church in silence. <laughs>
sing, I will sing to God and to the Lamb. I will sing to God and to the Lamb. Who is the great I am? While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing God's love for me. And through sing on and through eternity I'll sing